My name is Tyler David and you're watching Field of Dreams on ACTN. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Field of Dreams on ACTN. My name is Steve David and I'm, I'm your host. Today I want to talk to one of our special players, uh, not players, recruiters in TTFA. Let me take time to introduce my co-host first, Norada Wilson. Welcome to Seth Norada. Always a pleasure to be here, Steve, and I look forward to this interview, especially as it's one of the new positions or official positions given by the TTF, this new TTFA regime. And uh, next in the rider is the other popular Justin Reed. Welcome to Sir Justin. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for the Did invite. you know I played football with your dad in college and in um, thing? Well, you know what? He mentioned it to me, yes. but I didn't know the details of it. All right. Yeah. Good play. Played for Fatima, I played for St. Benedict, and then we joined the police service together. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. All right. So we're in good company. Um, <laughs> Justin, what is your portfolio? What is your title in the TTFA? And tell the viewers who Justin Reed is. Sure. So I am the um, Talent Identification uh, Player Pool Program Director for the girls. Um, the TTFA developed this program about three months ago. And the focus of the program is how can we identify North American-based players and bring them to the TTFA. Right. Um, we want to we want to do this program to help enhance the, the enhance the player pool, for right. example. Uh, so today we have about 200 players between the girls and the boys side who are in the pool. Um, just recently, with the under 20 uh, Concacaf qualifiers, out of the 20 players who uh, represented uh, the TTFA, we had nine players who were from uh, the, the North American based program. Unfortunately, two players ended up getting hurt during the camp, and they went back home. But in total, we had seven. And those players, they made a big impact in terms of us being able to qualify for the quarterfinals. Um, and of yeah. course, eventually, uh, we ended up losing uh, for nothing um, to, uh, to Mexico. But we had players on the field. Uh, uh, Kayla McFarlane is one. She is out of California. Uh, Sarah DeGans, she is out of Calgary, Alberta. And she actually ended up getting a scholarship mm -hmm. to a university um, in Georgia uh, just through this opportunity. Uh, Tori Paul, she's another one. She was from uh, the, the, the University of Maryland. So those were the three players out of the seven um, who made a big impact. But you're going to have a lot of frequent flyer miles because you have to drive <laughs> all of, around North America, right? Well, the, wherever you can. Yes. So the way that is set up is we have 27 scouts in total mm -hmm. in North America, and they're scattered all over the country. Okay. I'm based in the Washington, D.C. Okay. area. Right. So that's more my area, although, of course, I have to help oversee the scouts uh, in addition to uh, um, Sean Powder, who right. is the Talent Identification Program Director. He's actually the one who launched the program. Uh, he actually got in touch with uh, Keith LaCloy, who's the uh, TTFA Technical Committee. Mm -hmm. um, I discussed it with Keith as well. He brought us together. We put together a proposal. And then from there, the Technical Committee approved it. Um, in addition to Sean Powder and myself, uh, Johan Cantaste, who helped to put together the uh, style of play document that the TTFA has on its website. Right. Uh, he's actually based out of Seattle. So he's a part of uh, the group as well. And um, Wendell Moore is another one, and he's out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So us four are the committee. And then from there, like I mentioned, there's a total of 27 scouts who are scattered all over the country. Nirad is so excited to, <laughs> um, to, to kind of interview you. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy that, this conversation with you and Narada, and I will put in my two cents whenever I can. All right. So um, Narada, take it away. Buddy. Yeah, well, um, I would just like to introduce Justin to the viewers. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I met Justin 
probably about six years ago, um, mm -hmm. Barbados, you know, it's one of those guys who has Trini parentage, mm -hmm. you know, roots here, and um, was very interested in being part of Trinidad and Tobago's football setup in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, when I met Justin, it was at a seminar, you know, um, a conference, Soccer X, Barbados, and it was, you know, for a lot of stakeholders in football, and he was based in the States, and, you know, we kept the relationship open, and then to hear that you were involved in this, I think it's a plus for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Considering the fact that you did play a part in, you know, scouting and being an agent for some time <clears throat> in the States, where's Justin Reed right now, just for the viewers to know, and what pushed you to, you know, come in and be in part of this program, as well as why the woman side of it, if I could ask? Yeah, certainly. So it all started with a program that I developed in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. It's called uh, Quick Feet Soccer for Kids. And it's a program that I've had for about 15 years now. Um, main focus of that program is to work with kids at the grassroots level from two years old all the way up. Um, from that program has evolved various things like being a scout. So right. I was a scout for about four years right. under a right. company right. called the uh, Grayling Sports Agency. And we represented players in uh, the United Soccer League, um, uh, the North American Soccer League at the time, um, and then also mm -hmm. uh, Major League Soccer. Right. So it all became an evolution into how I can be a little bit more involved with football. Uh, it also took me to launch in a company called uh, Reed Sports Tours, and we host teams specifically from Africa, um, North America, and the Caribbean as well, uh, to come to the US. Yeah. Uh, last summer, I hosted a, a team from Barbados, um, St. Leonard's Boys School. Mm -hmm. And in return, we're sending five college coaches down to Barbados at the end of this month to do a college showcase. Right. And uh, these coaches are from Division I schools at the NCAA all the way down to the um, JUCO schools, um, the junior um, college schools as well. Right. So it was a good opportunity, you know, for these players to be seen, uh, for uh, the coaches to come directly to Barbados as opposed to the players having to come up to yeah. North America. There's mm -hmm. a big difference there. So in terms of me, Justin Reed, I'm, you know, touching all different spectrums <laughs> from the grassroots as young as two years old all the way up to the professional and I want to be as involved as much as possible so uh, the TTFA uh, talent identification program it's one role that I play and that's the girls side I'll help out with, you know with the bo with the boys side um, you know I help Sean help to put together um, a Google Drive which is what we did right. so in the Google Drive it's broken down by gender and it's broken down by the year of the player um, so we're looking at players as young as uh, 2013 so you're talking about kids who are seven years old right. who could possibly represent Trinidad. And we want to be able to identify these players early. Yeah. So of this, we have uh, now we're in the process actually of developing a scouting program. Uh, so Anthony Lambert, uh, who recently got hired as the uh, North American uh, director, actually mm -hmm. for the TTFA, the head scout. And in, in addition to um, uh, the UK as well, he's the head scout yeah. there. He's working with all the scouts now to develop a, a course and it's going to be a level one and a level two course that's going to allow us to be able to scout much better. So the talent identification program has a lot of growth and seeing that it's only been three months since we have been in existence, it's really going to benefit the TTFA in the long run. Yeah. Um, with that being said, um, what is your experience in terms of dealing with, dealing with um, recruiting the female players? I am asking that is because now you have to deal with certain other intricacies that may not have been necessarily with the boys. Um, you know, just safety, you know, while you deal with the parents, what is the process of someone who has maybe a parent or a grandparent that is with Trinidad and Tobago roots? How do they go about getting, being identified? Or in that case, how do you go about getting in touch with them? Right. So the very first part is the scouts. We have field scouts on the ground who right. will identify a player. So say there's a player in Seattle, Washington, for example. Um, that a scout will now send a player... Uh, profile form where the parent and the player has to go onto the form. They have to enter in all of their information. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we look at the player and we say, okay, in addition to the videos, this player is going to be a good fit for the national team pool. From there, on the girls' side, we'll recommend that player to the technical committee. Right. And it's up for the technical committee and the head coach of that team to decide, mm -hmm. okay, well, we want to bring on this player and um, we want to have her be a part of uh, the CONCACAF player pool. Or, or the TTFA player pool for the CONCACAF qualifiers. Now, some of the logistics we have to deal with in addition to just sending a player over are just the way the parents, first of all, they're females. 
right? So we have to be overly cautious right. in terms of making sure that they've got everything that they need because the parents are overprotective, and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. So, for example, the Dominican Republic uh, yeah. for the under 20s, there were a lot of logistics that had to take place in between there, for example, uh, getting them flights and parents asking a ton of questions. Um, is my kid going to be safe? Who's going to be there at the airport? Mm -hmm. All right, all of these little logistics that are extremely important to make sure that the transition is good, you know, from the time the player leaves North America to the time the player arrives at the camp. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your, your, your question in full, um, it, it, and, you know, it's more than just saying <clears throat> we want to send a player to the TTFA. There are passports involved, Correct. right? So, for example, Trinidad does not have, Trinidad and Tobago does not have a grandparent rule. Um, as opposed to, say, Barbados. They're mm -hmm. in the process of developing one. Uh, Suriname has one. Yeah. All right, a grandparent rule where, as you know, players of grandparentage can represent the national team. Trinidad does not have that. Right. So that has kind of been one of uh, the fallbacks in terms of recruiting the players that we need. So, for example, the under-20s, although we sent nine players, uh, seven who participated in the tournament, we could have gotten more. Yeah. But because of the grandparent rule, we weren't able to do so. I've got a question. Uh, what are we looking for? And did they give you a blueprint of what they're looking for from, from the head coach? Saying, Look, I'm, I need quick players or I need players who are very strong in the area. Or, what, or you just do what you think is best. Well, the scouts mm -hmm. on the ground that we have are extremely knowledgeable in terms of players. Like, um, for example, uh, Ashton Baptiste is one. He is based out of Orlando. Mm -hmm. He has a USSF A license. Uh, Myron Garns, he's another one, A license. Uh, mm -hmm. Kenrick Ramirez, Anthony Lambert included, Daniel McKeel. I mean, I can go on and on in terms of the team that we have in North America. We have guys with a ton of knowledge in terms of what it takes to be on the national team. Right. So once when they identify players, and as I mentioned, the whole process, it'll go off to the technical committee, and then from there they would make the decision. Um, so to answer your question, Steve, we're, we're in the process of developing um, a, a, a more streamlined process to have more of a blueprint that says, okay, well, if we're looking at the under-17s, for example, the, that girls' uh, CONCAC quali qualifiers, that's coming up April 18th. Mm -hmm. We want to find that player who's a good dribbler. We want to find that player who's great in the <clears> air. <throat> All that is in progress, and it's mainly because we're only three months old, so it's going to take time. But we're happy that we've got 27 scouts with a great a background sure. in terms of uh, their knowledge and they know what to look for. for the most no, I, like I, w I, was, I would think if they recommend somebody, yeah. no, a technical committee has to approve what? The technical committee doesn't, I haven't seen these players. And, and so I find it's like a, like a counter, yeah. a counterproductive. Um, yeah, I, I think I want some because just as Justin <clears throat> is explaining, um, I have seen some of the names of the guys who are scouts, and a lot of them have, you know, they've done scholarship programs in Trinidad, they've done camps, they've gotten persons to sign to universities abroad. So it's a, a wide range of guys who actually, as he said, you know, here in some of the qualifications, they're very much competent, competent to pick enough. players. Yeah. Um, and maybe in that situation, it should have just been down to maybe the TIPP guys, you all had just to say, hey, this is a player, you know, it's up to the coach now to say, right. It fits or it doesn't fit, right. but I don't think, you know, like necessarily, maybe it's not necessary to have the approval of the board right. yet, but that's an, just an additional, you know, maybe a barrier or just an additional signature that may not be necessary. However, from the scouts to just, I think, the tip, the TIPP guys, I think it should just be there. And then there's the coach to see it fits or it doesn't fit in the team. Right. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of the the logistics of the spread out in terms of Canada, right? Just let's say, because it's on the North America as well. How would, is it the same process as you guys getting the guys from the States who are based in the States, the scouts in the States, to get the information to you guys at it? Is Canada just as easy? Yeah. Or is it some sort of different mechanism that you have somebody head in Canada who kind of has all these scouts or it's just, you know, Justin is for female, he's at the top, we have the scouts underneath him, they send the information, you go through it. Or is Canada totally different, or is everything under North America? <clears throat> everything is under North, North America. Right. Now, where we are going, uh, based upon Anthony Lambert's plan, is to us to develop a, the field scouts and for us to develop regional scouts. Right. Um, yeah. And then that's going to trickle into the head scout. So that's now going to allow a three-step process for players, actually a four-step process 
from even if, say, the head coach of the team says, all right, well, I think um, Kayla <clears throat> can be a part of this national team, that still has to go to the field scout, who then goes to the regional scout, who then goes to the head scout. So it's really a four-step process. And that's where we're heading. Um, so we're broken up into four regions right now, and we're mainly focused in on Trinbagonian uh, areas. You know, so you have your New York, right. so you have Toronto, you have Florida. Uh, Florida and Atlanta, for example, mm. and Georgia, they're broken down into region two. And then you go over to Texas and Houston. Texas. Region one is our largest region because that's where most of the Trinbagonians are, if, even if you <clears> include <throat> Toronto. Toronto, for example, I think in total, we have about close to 400,000 Trinbagonians who are living at least in North America. I don't even think that includes the UK. <clears throat> they're Trinbagonians in, in Africa and Australia as well. All right. right. So um, that's how everything is going to be broken down as we continue to develop this program. But as of right now, we've got uh, 27 scouts total. I include myself as being a scout as well, mm -hmm. although I am the director and I'm more on the administrative side. So from there, we have that process where the scouts say, Justin, reach out to this player, reach out to this parent. Mm -hmm. I've got to work through the logistics. I connect with the technical committee. And then from there, that's how the players invited. Um, I know you have done a lot of work um, over the years in terms of connecting the U.S. And, and the Caribbean in terms of football. And I just wanted to get some of your insight on in terms of how do we know, what do you see as some of the obstacles that we have to face as Trinbagonians, getting our players up to the level of what the U.S. is offering, who have been the you know, in terms of the women's game, let's go with that. You know, that is Steve's favorite team, the U.S. Mm -hmm. national women team. <laughs> you know, so you're saying, how do we get our girls up to a standard, whether the under 15, <clears> under <throat> 17, or even the U20 level, to be competitive enough against the U.S.? It starts at the grassroots level. And um, the TTFA, and for those who are involved with the grassroots football, first off, they've, they've got to all work together, and they have to come under one banner and right. say, our goal is to make the, the women's team become a World Cup qualifying team. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., um, as I mentioned, so I've got a program, like I said, that starts at, at, at age two. And I've had kids throughout the program who have gone on and they've played for uh, D.C. United. They've gone on and they've played for all, you know, the different youth um, academy teams as well. So from the grassroots, you also have um, competitive soccer. All right, from competitive soccer, now you've got um, your ECNL, which is called the Elite Club National League, and also the Developmental Academy League. Right. From there, you, you know, if the player is good enough, that player will continue to remain in the system, or that player will just play high school soccer. Mm -hmm. At that point now, that player goes off to college, university, and then can eventually make uh, his, his or her way up to the professional pool. Right. So there are steps. Steps, yeah. In addition to those steps, there's also funding, and there are laws. So Title IX, which was enacted, I think, about 20, close to 20 years ago in the U.S., that said we're going to offer 14 scholarships to the women's program, although the men in college only have 9.9. Yeah. But we're going to invest money in the women because that's an opportunity now for the women to get funding and get opportunities. <clears throat> so the structure that the U.S. has is really, really, really strong. And with Trinidad only being a, uh, Trinidad and Tobago being a country of 1.3 million people, they, that can happen too. It can develop that structure. But that structure has to happen at the grassroots level and build its way up. Justin, let's take a little break and, and we'll be right back. Perfect. Okay, Thank views, you. We'll be right back. Lincoln Phillips, he is our ambassador for our program, for the mm -hmm. Talent Identification Program. Mm -hmm. And I know he is speaking with uh, Ambassador Spence, uh, who's based out of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. area. And um, that is his big project to work on, because if he can do that, and if, it, if we can get that done. We, from those encounters together, and this was a North-South game to open the season, so the team might be playing well, as we already, always say with Trinidad and Tobago. Futsal, did that great for me. Okay, hey everybody. Welcome to another edition of Fever of Dreams and ACTN. My name is Steve David. I'm your host.
Okay, welcome back, viewers. So, Justin, um, so you are the head honcho in, just uh, say that, over all the the scouts. The scouts, we call them? Is yes, that what you call them? Yes, yes, yes. But and just on the girls' side. Just on the girls' side. Sean Powder is the developer of the program, the Talent Identification Player Pool mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. But it was an idea that I had proposed to previous uh, TTFA administrations in the past. Right. And... It went on deaf ears, which is why I really appreciate this current administration that I think has been more open than any other administration in the past in terms of how they interact with the North American base um, Trinbagonians. You know, so Sean runs the program, but I am the administrator. Well, I want you to get some credit for your your insight and knowledge. <laughs> how did you come up with that, and what triggered you to to make this go down this kind of road? Well, I just thought there was a missed opportunity. And I think whenever you have uh, a business, so I'm a businessman as well, right. right? In addition to Sean, Sean does real estate development and gaming. I'm involved with sports, health, entertainment. Um, so once when you have an opportunity as a business to expand right. and you have people who want to do it and people who want to be a part of it to grow the business at home, you take advantage of it. So we saw with the U.S. being the U.S. and Canada being such huge Trinbagonian base bases, you know, for us to develop the TTFA, and we said, "Look, this is just a missed opportunity." All right, so we decided to say, "Okay, let's get as many Trinbagonians together who are involved with football." That's one of the criteria yeah. to be a scout. You have to be involved with football. Now we have allies as well, so we've got folks who aren't involved with football, but they can contribute and they can say, "Okay, well, look into this player, look into that player." Like for example, in Calgary. There is a, a, a Trinbagonian gentleman out there who's not involved with football anymore, but he sends us referrals mm -hmm. for players to look out to. And that's great because we have no scouts currently in Calgary. All right. Most of our scouts, like I mentioned, are in the Region 1 area. Mm -hmm. um, so this program was developed because we just saw a missed opportunity for the TTFA to take full advantage. And I think we're seeing... Um, the, the program be successful already just based upon what happened with happen. the under-20s. Yeah. And I think we're going to see more success with the under-17s in Mexico uh, April 18th. That, that's when their tournament begins. I'm quite impressed with, with, with what you guys are doing with your job, and, and we appreciate that. Now, where is home base away from home? In, in New York, in Washington, in Calgary? Where is we get together and or we just pick pick people and send them down to Trinidad. Right. So our base is New York. <coughs> you do know? Yes. So so New York's our base. Now, as scouts, we have not met all together okay. yet. All right. But like I said, the program is only three months old, but that's going to happen. Right. Uh, very, very soon, especially with having Anthony um, uh, Lambert a part of the program. He's saying, let's all meet. Let's all uh, take our level one, level two courses. So that gives us all an opportunity to meet. Um, we haven't chosen a location yet, but it's going to be a central location for everybody. And that's good because I'll tell you what, um, then I can, there is some kids who play, I think they'll take my little sweat, right? Uh -huh. And with the fathers and they bring the, the younger kids, 15, 16, 17, 18s, they play with us. But it's like from, from 17 to 70 or whatever. That is how we kind of run. And, and there's some good kids. So when you guys come to New York, I'm going to point you guys some decent kids. Wonderful. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's Good exactly man. what we need. Yeah. Um, what I was thinking is that just what you were saying about a missed opportunity, <clears throat> it was also something that, you know, had it not fallen on the deaf ears, as you said, in some regard, or just probably not be something that they saw as interesting at the time. Mm -hmm. You've seen a lot of other countries taking the steps and have been doing this for quite some time, considering the fact that we are a Caribbean island, we're a very small nation, but as I think I believe it was Keith LeCloy who was here was saying that, but we have 400,000 people outside who have kids, you know, grandkids that have Trinidadian parentage, Trinbagonian parentage, that we could have been using considering that the world is doing it, you know, mm -hmm. for us to be competitive against England, Germany and these countries, we have to access you know, some of the other players. And that's why we saw success with Suriname and um, Curacao more mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. you know, because they have taken advantage. Do you think there's a push? And maybe, I don't know, it may not necessarily come from your program, 
But is there a push to look into the grandparent rule or Trinidad creating something like that? Yes. So um, I have mentioned this to uh, uh, Keith LaCloy, mm -hmm. and I've told him, look, you know, if there's a way for the TTFA to um, speak with the administration, the current um, uh, Trinidad and Tobago administration, to find a way that we can um, be able to get that rule passed. Because Jamaica, for example, they have taken full advantage mm -hmm. of that rule, in fact. <clears throat> um, the women's team, they just recently uh, qualified uh, for the World Cup last year, and they're the first Caribbean team to do it. And from that women's team, if you ever listen to any of the interviews, they're all North American accents, mm -hmm. right? They're not Jamaican accents, they're right. North American accents. Mm -hmm. And you're going back generations to find players. Uh, so that's what Jamaica's been able to do in order and able to qualify. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's it's in the works, right. but it's something that's going to take time. Course, um, yeah. Lincoln Phillips, he is our ambassador for our program, for the mm -hmm. Talent Identification Program. Mm -hmm. And I know he is speaking with uh, Ambassador Spence, uh, who's based out of Washington, Washington. D.C. area. <clears throat> and um, that is his big project to work on, because if he can do that, and if, it, if we can get that done, that's going to open up the, the, the floodgates, and we're going to be able to get a lot of talent from North America to help the, um, the locals here in Trinidad. Um, so the recent team that had success by most standards, because I think a lot of us, because of the short period of time, weren't really expecting to, for them to reach too far, if we could put it that way. And they did reach far or further than most people were estimating. <clears throat> um, the results of that may have come from the players based in the North American region, simply because they have more constant football. They probably have better preparations, you know, facilities and all that. Have been, they've just been playing consistently for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Do you take from that and then you all go and review to be able to now push for more things to be done in the future simply because you have statistics that are showing that these three or maybe even seven players that we sent were able to prove that they were better than some of the local players that were basically or at least a little more advanced and we were able to benefit from them. So is the program showing rewards based on what you've discussed more recently with your counterparts? So one thing I will say is that we've got some really good female players here in okay. Trinidad. Uh, I mean, uh, Afia Cornwall was great this tournament. Um, Alexia Ali, Ali she's she was, good she was amazing too. And I, and I found out about them during the tournament yeah. because remember my focus is just on the North American based players. I don't know too many of the local players. Right. Um, so you include those two, two um, Maria Sarant, I, yeah, I believe Sarant, is her name yeah. as well. You know, mm -hmm. she did amazing <clears throat> as well. So our program is more just to help enhance. Our program is not to say the, um, the North American players are better. No, right. mm -hmm. we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Our job is to help enhance what's here locally mm -hmm. so that as a country, Trinidad and Tobago, we can be successful um, mm -hmm. at that level. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, to answer your question, Nareda, what we did was we put together a survey um, and we got responses from four out of the seven. I say seven right. because those, the seven were the ones who did the camp right. and the tournament. Amazing feedback. Um, they all said, yes, if a call up were to happen again, we'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, when you're talking about Trinbagonians based in the United States and Canada and Trin Trinbagonians here, there's always going to be a discrepancy in terms of culture. Right. So the camaraderie was the one thing on the survey that wasn't there. And that's a known, right? That's yeah. a given. I only started to come back to Trinidad, I'll say, within the last maybe 10, 15 years. And the first time I came back, I always questioned. I said, well, why doesn't Trinidad have this or why doesn't Trinidad have that? Well, Trinidad is not the United States and it's not yeah. Canada. Trinidad and Tobago is Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago. Right. Right. right? So the um, U.S. and Canadian-based players have to understand that what they have Right. in the U.S. and in Canada is not necessarily what's going to be here. So they have to adapt to the culture here in Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago mm -hmm. for us to be successful. Yeah. But having said that, there are various things that you can do to unite the Trinbagonians and the U.S. Uh, Canadian-based players, mm -hmm. especially at camps. Yeah. You can have them interact with each other by saying, okay, well, maybe you have two um, uh, Trinbagonian players at, 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 uh, sitting at a table for lunch or breakfast or dinner. And then you add in maybe three North American-based players. Correct. That way, they're now forced yeah. to interact with each other. And you don't have clicks. You don't have the Trinbagonians sitting at one table, the North Americans sitting yeah. at one table, because that's not going to help the team uh, come right. Yeah. right. So that was one of the main things in the survey 
that the players would love to see right. a lot more. But for the most part, the survey was extremely positive. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, something to recommend is also um, just from my experience, because um, over the years we've done, you know, a lot of cultural exchanges is what we call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say look at some of the senior um, national players who probably not necessarily on the senior team anymore. And my recommendation, because I've worked with the person, would be somebody like a Lauren Hutchinson, mm -hmm. who is somebody who familiarized themselves with Trinidad and Tobago and could be a better person to translate that onto the younger players or the players for the first time who are coming down because she's had the experience over the years of being in national teams. And she may have gone through that same transition period, mm -hmm. but rather than have them experience it firsthand only when they reach here, mm -hmm. that you get somebody to prep them prior. It's something we would do when we bring players from overseas here. We would meet them up there. We'll tell them, hey, Trinidad is this, right. there's this, you could get this done, can't get this done. Right. You know, so they, they kind of have an understanding. And then when they see it, they're not too much in shock with things that are better or worse in their mindset. You know, that is right. something to integrate the players because they speak an easier language than us coming from the administrative or coaching level down to them. You use it with somebody on the ground already, which we have quite a few of those girls, Aaron King, Lauren Hutchinson, a lot of them who've had the experience over the years. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and it, I think, go ahead. go ahead. Is there any mold that you guys are looking at um, as far as player selection? Like, we want, we want a certain type of player or a certain look? What, what is it? Yeah, so as I mentioned, <laughs> um, with the scouting program that Anthony uh, you know, Lambert's going to be putting together, that's going to help us to better understand. Uh, th there will be better communication mm -hmm. between what the TTFA is looking for on the ground in terms of players. But with the program being so young, only mm -hmm. three months old, um, we're just really utilizing the, the strong team that we have. I mean, we really have a strong team. I can't emphasize it enough, the knowledge that is on our conference calls. Like we had one, um, so, so we hold a conference call the second Sunday of every month. Right. And this gives us an opportunity to discuss um, the month uh, previously, the month ahead. Right. And then we have a forum towards the end where it's open discussion, give suggestions, you know? So as we continue to develop the program, we will have a better understanding as far as what each player, um, what what the TTFA is looking for. for each player. Mm -hmm. In terms of the under 17 tournament that is coming up right now, mm -hmm. what has been some of the work that has happened with you guys' involvement? Because obviously we have an under 17 team that would be training or in preparation for that, seeing that it's so soon coming up. What has been demanded of you guys um, or what have you all done so far and what could we look forward to in terms of have you come across quite a few players that you, we might be looking forward to? Not necessarily to name, but just in numbers and just give us some feedback on that tournament, what to expect. Yeah, great question. So we currently have eight players that will be going to, to Mexico. Okay. Um, and the camp is scheduled for April 8th. Okay. Um, th those players will, they're, so they're coming from all over. Um, in terms of names, I can name a few. Right, so um, okay. Maya Joseph is a tremendous player who comes highly um, recommended. Um, Nia Hislop, right. uh, that is um, Shaka Hislop's daughter. Okay. She will be uh, in, in the tournament as well. So these players, um, I'll add another one, uh, Jada Gibson. She plays for an elite, elite club national league team, a developmental academy right. team, my apologies, in San Diego. So we have players who are part of really, really good programs in the U.S. that are competitive. And seeing that the United States women's <clears throat> national team, they're the best in the world, that's the level that these players are training at. So they're training at three to four times a week. They, they're playing games during the weekend. So this is their commitment. These players want to play in college. Right. So that's the level of players that we're getting to add to um, the national team, to the so under-17. College would be kind of your stumping ground to look for players or outside at clubs and stuff, or U.S. colleges I'm talking about. Yeah. So that'll be more your concentration would be there. More. Yeah, it depends on the age group. So for the under 20s, mm -hmm. colleges were, that, that was our target. So <clears> we <throat> had one player from uh, Brock University, right, uh, Arnell Douglas, and she actually came in on the second game and she was uh, the left back against um, the Cayman Islands. That was the second game we played. Played great. Um, I'll say uh, Khalil Keshwar. She's another one. Yeah, she's sure. Trinbagonian based, uh, but she's playing at St. Francis, St. Francis University yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh, she made a big save against um, Puerto Rico, right, to advance us on mm -hmm. to the quarterfinals. 
So depending upon the age group, so if we're looking at under 20, then it's possible that we can find the college players. Uh, Nigel Myers, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, yeah. from the Soka, Soka Warriors. Yeah. He <clears throat> has been instrumental in helping us to locate players. Because he has a, a very wide library, and he has like a lot of information on players and parentage. And you know, just for a very long time, he's just had all of this information just sitting there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. What about, so, what about um, lead. the Women's Professional League in the U.S.? We have any players that we find in, in that league at all? Uh, in, it, in the National Women's Soccer League, I don't believe so. Yeah. I don't believe there are any uh, Trimbegonians currently yeah. playing in that league. Well, they must have, they must have some punk and vines. Yeah, so I guess in the grandfather of, rule, might, yeah, grandfather <laughs> grandparents rule. rule might be something to help because I'm sure True. we may find one or two that may have had some parentage, but I think they might have been on the team at some point. Right. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's a great league, man. It is. It is. And so, they have good players in that league. It is. Yeah. And if you look at the women's national team for the U.S., all 23 who won the World Cup came from that league. Exactly. And, I mean, the U.S., they can, the women's team, they can put two or three or four teams together and still possibly be the best in the world. Exactly. That's how much, that's exactly. how much talent comes from that league. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. And in terms of access to, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, because Steve spoke of the colleges, how easily accessible is it for you guys out there to get into the high schools in the U.S. to find out? Is it something that is easily accessible? As in Trinidad, for example, we have a great secondary school league, you know, mm -hmm. both male and female. And so for us, we could just go to secondary school league games and we'll find out how is that situation in the States? Is, this, is the high school league okay, easily accessible, or would it have to come from just more or less the club level at the younger, the under 17 and under 15, if you have to look? Yeah, so the high school league, it is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way the United States is structured now. It's like if you have access to the developmental academy and you have access to the ECNL, the Elite Club National League, then well, that's, that's where you play. Cool. Right. And if you play in those leagues, you cannot play in high school. Right. However, it doesn't mean that there isn't talent right. so at the high school level. Right. And that's one thing that one of our scouts mentioned. He said, <clears throat> okay, and he runs a, uh, a club in um, Indianapolis, I believe. He mentioned, well, why are we only looking at ECNL and Developmental Academy? There are kids in high school, there are kids at the club level who are good enough. Right. Um, so right now, it's open market, but really in order for us to locate the players, it has to be the scout, has to be on the ground, and we have to be knowledgeable that that player is of the Trinbegonian descent. They have AYSO leagues yeah. with, with, from U team all the way to adult teams. Mm -hmm. And like one club, let's say, would have maybe 400 players because I know that from Arizona with all the different. So these leagues have really great players. They do. And I don't know how you guys are going to do that, but there's a lot of those in the U.S. There are. There are. And, and what we will do um, by the end of this year is we are looking at doing talent identification programs around the country. Right. So um, Sean actually mentioned something earlier today to me, uh, if we can set up centers, very similar to what the U.S. does. They have centers, they have regional centers that they set up within the three regions, and they invite maybe up 60, 70 players. They'll come, it's a free program, they evaluate the best possible players. The Trinbegonians, for example, we, we, we won't get that many because <clears throat> you're talking about an open pool of 60, 70 players as long as you were born in the United States you're going to be a part of that. And of course, if you're good enough, you're going to be a part of that pool. But even for, say, if we were to get 30 or 40, that still provides us mm -hmm. um, yeah. a, a forum and an atmosphere to look and identify players. So that's going to be the way that we're going to identify the players is within the region, the four regions that we have set up. So we will have a talent identification pool program in each region that allows the players to come and be identified. Okay, Justin, let's take a break, but and, and we'll be right back, all right? Thank you. Viewers, we'll be right back. We just recently, uh, we recently got a grant from Target, um, and Target gave us a grant in order to offer uh, free uh, classes in the inner cities. So we're looking at areas like Baltimore, we're looking at Washington, D.C., uh, mm -hmm. and we're looking at Philadelphia. And this is going to give us an opportunity now to... ACTN, The Voice, your family-friendly station.
Okay, welcome back, viewers. Uh, so, uh, Noel, you wanted to ask, yeah. uh, continue. Um, so, you know, we're getting a lot about the talent identification, play a pool, something that is reaping rewards. Um, but I just wanted, you know, the interview to also be about who is Justin Reed and some of the other things that you've been working on, you know, highlighting a lot of accomplishments by persons, both with, you know, Caribbean, African roots, mm -hmm. you know, in the States and all of that. Um, there's an organization that you're part of and you run, and I don't know if you care to share. I've even been part of it, you know, where you, you really take a deep interest into certain things that we are actually facing in football, you know, from the racism aspect to the low percentage of persons in administrative, you know, from coaching positions, and even when accomplishments of, you know, black players that are, you know, featuring in Europe and in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So if it's something you could take us through for this segment. Sure, absolutely. So in 2018, I co-founded an organization called the Black Soccer membership association and the focus of the organization is to empower black coaches administrators um, referees and players and we wanted to target how can we be an advocate on their behalf how can we provide resources on their behalf to help them um, so with the the uh, the BSMA program what we did was we established a grant for coaches that will allow them to uh, be able to pay for their licenses right all right um, in, the, in the United States, soccer coaching education is extremely expensive. Uh, you're talking about $4,000 to take a USSFA license, mm -hmm. and that can take almost up to maybe about six months to acquire, in addition to um, all of the travel, all of the, you know, the accommodations that are needed, just everything. So we wanted to support <clears throat> black coaches in this spectrum because every time you look at a picture in terms of um, you know, who's a part of the class, you always, only tend to see one black coach at a time. And it can be that the coach is not mm -hmm. good enough. It just means that economics does not allow the coach and time does not allow that coach to be able to take mm -hmm. that course. Um, so that was one of our focuses, or that is uh, one of our focuses, is how we can get more coaches into mm -hmm. the education uh, program. Um, we also focus on business development in terms of clubs. We have quite a few... Uh, black coaches who run clubs as well in the U.S., and we wanted to figure out how can we support them. Um, and this came about because I ran a club years ago under the Quick Feet Soccer program back in about, I think it was about 2012. And because we were the small club on the block, we ended up actually getting eaten up by the big club. And that mm -hmm. tends to happen right. in the U.S. a lot. You usually got your three or four really big clubs, and you got all these <clears> little clubs. So there are a lot of black coaches who have a lot of little clubs, and we wanted to find a way to see how can we protect those clubs and how can we support them so that they can grow. All right, so we developed a uh, club development grant in order to do that. The last thing we do is we work within the inner cities. So we have a program called Soccer to Achieve, mm -hmm. and um, we just recently, uh, we recently got a grant from Target. Um, and Target gave us a grant in order to offer uh, free uh, classes in the inner cities. Right. So we're looking at areas like Baltimore, we're looking at Washington, D.C., uh, <clears throat> and we're looking at Philadelphia. And this is going to give us an opportunity now to promote the sport and give children an opportunity and access to the sport. Because in the U.S., the biggest problem that we have is it's, it, it's a pay-to-play system. Now, some of the folks within the soccer coaching network uh, for the BSMA, they say that we should get rid of the pay-to-play model, but some of those folks are the same ones who are benefiting from it. So I'm more middle of the road where I understand, okay, well, the pay-to-play model in the U.S. allows us an opportunity to work in mm -hmm. soccer full-time. But we do understand that the children and the families who do not have $3,000, $4,000 a year, some clubs are even up to $10,000 a year, they can't afford that. So that's why we've got the Soccer to Achieve program to allow them access to the sport. Would would you guys like in the states? Would you have combined to see the people, or you just go to their scrimmage or to their wherever they're playing and see them, or do you invite them to one spot to kind of um, fine tune your selection? So with the soccer to achieve program, is that yeah. is that the question? Okay. So with that program, we go directly to schools in the inner cities. And this is open to any right. child who wants to get out there, run, exercise, kick the ball around. Right. We don't have to have any specific level. We just want any player who wants to learn the game, 
to come on out, mm -hmm. and we give our uh, black coaches within our association more the younger guys who aren't quite established, the ones who don't have licenses, mm -hmm. we give them an opportunity to go out and work with the kids because it's an entry for them to be able to also decide, okay, well, is coaching soccer something that I want to do in the future? And your talent identification program, it is, does it do, run the same way? No, totally different. <laughs> you don't totally get together in one spot? Uh, oh, it, in, in terms of, okay. Selection. Uh, uh, oh, uh, in, in terms of selection. Okay, so if we're... <laughs> Drifting away from the BSMA I know, now I know, yeah. a bit. But, yeah, so talent identification program, we will get all together in one spot. That's just a matter of time okay. until that program develops. And as oh, I yeah. said, uh, Anthony Lambert is... I was just comparing and contrasting the, the, the two different okay. levels. And yeah. in terms yep. of, <clears throat> to touch on Steve with, you know, how comparing it, in terms of you, you know, trying to give opportunities, would you say that, in your organization, there's an opportunity for the Caribbean coaches, administrators, even players, you know, to probably be part of it to try and see maybe a benefit as well. Because if you have an opportunity for a grant to, you know, take part in one of the coaching mm -hmm. levels, it may be something that maybe the Trinidadian coaches could look at signing up, being part of, and maybe having an opportunity, you know, even if they have to come, you know, take care of the travel or whatever but at least have an opportunity that they could probably benefit from something like that as well. Right. So Trinidadian coaches, Trinidad and Tobago <laughs> coaches based here, you're talking about yeah, if it, possibly if, being yeah. a part of the program? Yeah. Um, as of right now, mm -hmm. because we are more focused on the United Soccer Coach, uh, the, not United Soccer Coach, but the USSF programs, Right. not right now. Right. But, right. And it's then, mainly, so let's use the US. scouts now. The okay. scouts, our scouts that are Trinidadian based in the US, could they take an opportunity like this if they wanted to better themselves over yes. the period of time. Yes, they can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And would it be something that, is it something that you've put forward to them also to take advantage of the opportunity because they're now working with our um, federation. So I think it would be in their best interest to also look at opportunities to better themselves mm -hmm. to then give us a better shot at competing at some of the higher levels because they play a part in it now. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's something that we can look at in the future. Right. I have not mixed the yeah, Black the two, Soccer Membership right, Association and Talent Identification right. Program. They're two totally separate entities. Right. But I think at some point in time, there will be a cross-reference. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you have Quick Feet Soccer, <laughs> you have uh, Black <laughs> Soccer, and then you have a Talent ID Program. Uh -huh. Are you using anyone, like the two, your Quick Feet and, and the Black Soccer Program, to help your Talent ID are you connecting this in any way, shape, or form? Not right now. <laughs> okay. Not right now. Just because they're all at different levels. Right. Like the Quick Feet Soccer Program, that's more for grassroots. Right. I'm not going to get a, a licensed coach to be a part of the Quick Feet you know, Soccer Program from the Talent <clears throat> Identification Program. So they're just two totally separate entities. Now, I will say, out of the Black Soccer Membership Association, before the TIP program was created right. back in December, there were coaches who are already a part of that program. Right. So I did tap that resource in order to find Trinbagonian coaches who are based in North America. So that's the only time at that point that it's actually And since the quick feet, since you've mm -hmm. been part of the grassroots coming up, yep. so far do you think you may have worked with a player who might be able to be on our national team over the years, you know, from seeing that you're taking them from two to whatever age, um, you may have come across a couple of players that would have had Trinidad lineage and could they represent or would they possibly represent in the future? Is they it? Yes, certainly. So there was one player, um, <clears throat> Jonathan Goddard. He's currently overseas right now. He went to uh, Mount St. Mary's right. and he played, there for, he played there for a season. But he started with the Quick Feet program at four. So he's one of the, the founding uh, uh, players of the program when it first started. So Jonathan is of uh, Trinbagonian descent, his mom is, and he actually played for the under 20, or he was in the pool for a little bit. Um, so now he's overseas, he's right. decided to pursue uh, football as a career right. right now, and he is interested in being a part of uh, the player pool program again. Okay. Um, he's 20, 21 years old, so he doesn't qualify for the under 20s, but he would qualify if there's an under 23 right. or, right. or a senior oh, team. So once again, that's just, a cross-reference from something that happened years ago, and it just so happened that his mom is of uh, Tr Trinbagonian descent. But to answer your question uh, a little bit more in detail, yes, I <clears> am <throat> on the lookout. You know, so with my Quick Feed program, you know, I know we start as young as seven for the talent uh, identification player pool, pool, and I know there is one player 
in my program who could also join um, the TIP program as well. So um, left let, let me ask, is there timelines now for, for what you're doing with, with the Talent ID program? Mm -hmm. Do we have timelines that this is where we want to be at, at so, so, so and so time? Great question. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So the timelines, um, so Keith uh, LaCloy put together the 2026 vision right, program. Correct. And that's what we're geared towards. We're geared towards that 2026 vision. Um, and before that, of course, it will be the FIFA Women's World Cup. Right. 2023 right. is also important for us as well. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're pretty much following that timeline in terms of how many scouts we want to have within the next year, two, three years. How many players we want to have in the pool within the next one, two, three years. All right. So there are milestones that we are going to meet right. and we're working towards. Um, but it's definitely going to take continuous development. And I, and I will say one thing, the TIP program is more than just how can we identify a player? Like of there's course. an administrative part to it. And that's where I fall in, in terms of the hours that we have to put into this program to get it done. You know, if it's me uh, texting Keith late, you know, nine o'clock, hey, Keith, you know, we need to get this done or we need this to get done. And as I said, the administration has just been totally open. They have been cooperative. And it's been just an amazing experience so far. So there are timelines. So you know, what's the know. first date we're going to sit back and evaluate and say, okay, and we were here and now we're here and we have 10% of what we're looking for or whatever. What, when is that going to happen, the first evaluation? First full evaluation, um, I would say, will most likely be within the next three more months. Yeah. Right. We want to do this in six-month increments. Now, Sean and I, we're evaluating every single day. Um, we're looking at the Google Drive folder and we're figuring out how can we make it better. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigel Myers came in and I mean, he just did an outstanding job just to streamline the process. So everything is being evaluated from an administrative standpoint. And then we're also evaluated by results, <clears throat> right? So you can even, I'll go back to the under 20s. That was great. You know, we met our objective. The quarterfinals, that was our objective. You know, the TTFA's objective, that was our objective, so we and, that. and we did it, yeah. right? We have a similar objective for the under-17s as well that's coming up. Um, so as long as these milestones are met, and as long as our goals are met, then it makes the um, ability to kind of analyze the program a lot better. But I will say within three months, it's been a great success, and it's only going to get better. Okay. We run out of time, so we have a, another minute that I can ask you to... You want to make an appeal to whoever to talk to somebody out there who can enhance your program or, or help? I'll give you time to do that. Well, certainly, I, I, I will start off by congratulating you guys on the facility that's been built in Port Fortin, and I can't wait to make my way down there. Right. Um, I have been a part of programs, um, well, facilities that have been built, you know, from the ground up, and I've been a part of facilities that... Um, had been built, you know, within the, the five years. So I'm very familiar in terms of, you know, what it takes, you know, from the beginning to the end, you know, and I will make a plea for um, the people of Trinidad and Tobago to support your facility because Appreciate your it. facility is extremely important to the base. The base is Trinidad and Tobago, and I will stress it again. <clears throat> um, I think sometimes with us living overseas, um, people look at it as, okay, well, the North Americans could be a threat mm -hmm. to the Trinbagonians, and that is not the case. We're here to support Trinidad and Tobago. That's our main focus. Right. So as your facility grows, and hopefully you guys can have others in the future. Right. You know, I mean, Arima, maybe, right? So that's where <laughs> I'm based. Come on out there, you know, build a, a, a field of dreams there, and I will definitely be there to support it. You know, so that would be my plea. Um, right. Let's build Trinidad and Tobago from the grassroots. Justin, I want to thank you for being here, buddy. Um, uh, I w met your dad in, in in college, and we played football, and, and then I and we did some stuff and in the police service. And I know you come from good background, so <laughs> continued success. Thank you, thank you, all the best to you all as Appreciate well. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you. Thank for you having again, Nurada, for being here. ACTN, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Viewers, thank you for tuning in. And we do have a Facebook page. You can check us out. And we do have an email address, pwgtt.gmail.com. You can drop us a line. Show is ended. Go in peace. My name is Steve David. Good night.